We shouldn't use psychology to influence people, eh? It's like a strawberry with a tail. The closest thing we had to a camp bird was a hippo called Mitchie. Wait, those of you that have just paused the video and typed in Lance, wait! Uh, oh god, that hurt one of my many chins. Of us wearing our buffs, this is actually Mushatu, but you know. You give uh, buffaloes to your guests? Please don't get eaten. Hi everybody and welcome back to the Safari Shots podcast episode 4 with me Felia Stein and my co-host Lawrence van der Feyfer. Lawrence, how are you doing man? Yeah, very well yourself. I'm well thanks. You can see I'm quite cold. I'm actually down in the Cape at the moment visiting my mother. Uh, you look like you're quite hot. I was going to say you look freezing. It's about uh, 753 degrees here currently in Hutzbreit. Um And of course my office doesn't have an aircon or anything, so I am cooking. <laughs> I can actually hear the fan going in the background. Well, Lance, it's great to see you again. And for all of you guys tuning in, today we are going to be talking about Mana Pools National Park in Zimbabwe. As some of you might remember from episode two, uh, we told you that Lance and I, we actually led photographic safaris in Mana Pools over the same time in September. I led a trip for Africa Geographic to a place called Chitaki Springs and Lance led a trip for his company Panthera Photo Safaris down along the river itself and at, then at another camp a little bit further away from the river. So in this episode we're basically going to give you some proper trip reports on our two respective safaris, uh, maybe share a few photos and highlights with you and give you some solid mana pools tips if you ever decide to go there as well. And we'll actually tell you about our upcoming safaris next year back to mana pools. And then don't forget the biggie today, and you have to tune in or stay tuned for that one, is the little prize, the trophy there in the background, Lance, the um, uh, best photograph by one of us as voted by you trophy, uh, where we're going yeah. to <laughs> show you um, my best photograph that I took in Monopools and Lance is going to share his bit of best photographs from Monopools and you guys are going to get a chance to vote which one is best and one of us will keep that little trophy for a little while. So you mean uh, the biggest trophy in the world. What are you talking about? <laughs> this is huge, man. <laughs> and then another thing to stay tuned for is at the end, we're going to go and look at the photographs that you shared on the Safari Shots podcast hashtag on Instagram. And each of us are going to choose our favorite photograph that was posted recently and also a photo where we're going to give you a little bit of feedback. And just like last time, we've got a new sponsor for this week and we'll choose someone randomly and give you an awesome prize. So thanks, well, while, before I forget, thank you so much for everybody that shared photos. I don't know about you, Lance, but I had a look and there's a ton of photographs that have been shared on Instagram. So we had a yeah. lot to choose from. It, no, it was amazing. So I, I have not been, I've been home about three days since August sometime. Um, <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't been on. And then I went there today, obviously, to look through, and there is a lot of photos and some amazing pictures. So thank you so much all for sending those through. Um, this week was really difficult because yeah, there was. was some incredible There images. were some incredible yeah. shots, yeah. yeah I, I think we will get to that. I think chances are smaller this time that we would have chosen, uh, chosen the same shot. But yeah, let's, let's get back to Mana Pools. Um, Lance, so uh, maybe you can start us off. Remind everybody, um, where did you guys stay in Mana Pools? And yeah, give us your, your first thoughts about your trip. Yeah, so, so this trip was actually incredible. We had two trips uh, back to back. So uh, six guests, uh, two trips each. Uh, sorry, one trip each. But, uh, and then we went to two different camps. Um, so we went to Zambezi Expeditions, which is right on the river, is absolutely stunning. And then we finished off at Kanga Camp, uh, which is a little further inland. It's far away from the river, um, and it's the only source of water for miles and miles and miles. So all the animals there actually come to you, which is incredible. So they, they've coined the term armchair safari, um, and the idea there is you actually spend more time in the camp photographing the animals that come to you than you do going out looking for animals. Um, but we went out looking anyway, because, you know, why not? Um, but yeah, it, it was absolutely fantastic. So interestingly, the, the two groups had um, quite different safaris. So they were right next to each other. So one week and then the next week, um, they, were, they were quite different sightings wise. Uh, we saw pretty much all the same animals, but what we got out of the, the two trips was, was quite different, um, which just goes to show that there is a bit of luck involved in safaris. Um, but both safaris were absolutely incredible. We got awesome shots. 
Um, we had the best time. I don't want to give too much away uh, so far, but I believe uh, we actually got to the camps a little bit differently, you and I. So I know we flew in. Um, we flew to Harare straight from South Africa, and then we got on a small plane, hour and a half, a very hot, bumpy little plane, um, hour and a half. We had a few people that didn't quite make it, uh, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> but an hour and a half, we were actually there. I believe your little trip was a bit different uh, on the yeah, way Yeah, so not only did we get there differently, we also went to a different part of Mana Pools. So we went to a place called Chitaki Springs, which is actually closer to the entrance of Mana Pools, but very far away from the river. So we um, took a flight to Arari, and from there we took a road transfer. It was about a five-hour road transfer um, to Chitaki Springs. But that was quite nice, actually, because the six of us, unlike when you're in a small aircraft where everybody's trying to just keep their food in, we could actually <laughs> chat and have fun on the road, um, stop for some biltong and coffee along the way. So we had quite a, a, a lovely drive down, and you actually go down the escarpment when you, you, know, you mm. get closer. So it was a lovely drive to Chitaki Springs. Um, where we actually stayed in um, at a public campsite. Now that mm. might sound weird. Um, there's actually only three public campsites at Chitaki Springs, but we got a local mobile operator to set up a camp for us. So Africa Geographic Perfect. was the photographic company that put the trip together. I led the safari, and then um, we had this uh, Zimbabwean tour operator that that got the camp ready for us. So when we arrived there, the tents were pitched, um, mm. we had cool drinks and, and face cloths, just like you would at a lodge, awesome. but everything was a little bit more rustic, um, and we basically had very basic, simple tents lined up um, on the side of the, the dry Chitaki River. Um, and then we also had a local Zimbabwean hiking or, or walking guide um, that, that kept us safe, basically, for the, the eight days that we stayed at Chitaki Springs. But definitely very, very different um, from down at the river. But I think at this point, it's a, it's a good first tip for anybody that wants to go to Mana Pools. Much like a lot of the parks in Zimbabwe, which is a very dry climate, it's very important to go the right time of the year. So in Mana Pools specifically, you'll have most of your action happening in the dry season, and especially towards the late dry season, and that's why both Lance and I led our safaris um, in September. Uh, here in Southern Africa, that's sort of pushing towards the end of the dry season, just before the first rains fall. Um, I've actually been to Mana Pools in March one year, and I tell you what, it was wet, and you couldn't drive anywhere, you just got stuck everywhere, and because it was so wet and there was so much standing water in the felt, very few animals actually came down to the water holes and more importantly down to the river. But um, we were there in exactly the right time of the year. So anything yeah. I would say from I would say from July through to October, those would be your yeah. best months. If you go in November, I think it'll be very, very hot and possibly you'll already have your first rains and then you know you might just bomb out completely. Um, but Lance, tell me when I when when I think of um, the river where you started um, down, you know, right on the Zambezi River, the shots that come to mind are wild dogs on foot and elephants standing on their hind legs, eating those yeah. leaves off those beautiful anna trees. Did you guys get those quintessential mana pool shots on your safari? So we actually, we did. Um, Everything that we wanted when we went there, we, we were very lucky and we got. So for me, um, I wanted obviously to see Boswell. I think everyone wants to see Boswell. Uh, for those guys who don't know, Boswell is the big tusker who has perfected standing on his back feet. Um, there's actually, they think, five young bulls now, or up to five elephants that do stand on their back feet. Wow. But very quickly. It, it's kind of like a, oh, oh, grab a leaf and then they fall down. Boswell will stand there for 20, 30 seconds on his back feet. Um, they must do some more can, crunches to get their You can see the muscles in his wow. side that the ele other elephants don't have. It, it's absolutely incredible. Um, so... Like I was saying before, the, the two trips were very different. So the first group, we saw some of the best dog sightings I've yeah. ever personally had. Um, we had one of the packs that, with all their puppies, about three meters from us, lying all around in the open at sunset. It was absolutely stunning. Wow. Um, and they, they were lucky. They saw Boswell, I think, three times, um, but he didn't perform for them. So... He stood on his back feet. Technically, they saw it, but it was through the trees. And one time, as we were climbing out of the Land Rover, we saw him way over there, oh. standing on his back feet. We got to him. He went to sleep. 
But um, he's got those beautiful tusks, right? He, he's he does, just a beautiful he elephant to photograph, even if he doesn't stand up. Big perky tusks, yeah. Uh, wow. very, and, he's, and he's just beautiful. And the fact that he's so used to people coming to see him. I mean, at one point, we were five, six meters from him, and he was completely... He doesn't even look at you, um, which is an, also just incredible. Just to be around him mm. and the other bulls that hang around him is very cool. And then the second group, um, we, we got lucky. We saw the dogs only once. Um, because the dogs decided to leave, they just had their pups, so they were they were mobile. Um, but we saw Boswell standing on his back feet maybe fifteen, twenty wow. times. Um, yeah, and uh, some of them not in the best place. And then that one afternoon, on the bank, nothing in the way, mm. front light, side light, back light, up his nose, down his trunk, uh, ev everything. So really, well, so really cool. And the fact that we went for that shot and we got it is it's magic. Yeah. Well, that's something that you have to remember about Mauna Pools. It's the only national park that I'm aware of where you can walk even without a guide. In other words, I can drive there with my own car and get out and walk. Now, of course, if you do that completely on your own and, and if you're not bushwise, it can be extremely dangerous. Um, Please but don't get most of these camps do have guides that will walk with you, but they encourage walking. And a lot of these animals like Boswell are very relaxed. And like Lawrence said, that gives you the opportunity to photograph that animal in front light, back light, side light. So it's not just about seeing this animal once, it's about seeing him multiple times, multiple yeah. times, and then having all these options to really create um, a exactly, special yeah. shot of an iconic animal. And, and also, um, for people who are staying in their own camp and their campsites and things like that, if they want to walk, they can pick up a guide from the main reception. So you don't, right. you don't have to book a tour or anything like that. You can go and get your own guide um, to, to go with you, which is, yeah. which is brilliant. It's better if you are not around animals a lot, because there, there are some stories out there. Um, yeah. If you don't know animals yeah. that well, please absolutely. go get a guide. Don't, don't no, it's animals. absolutely. It's definitely <laughs> worth it. So tell me, Lawrence, I was wondering about it. I saw that... Um, I've never seen Boswell, but I see that he's got a radio collar on. And yes, um, as yes. far as I understand, those, that collar is important because these elephants can leave the park and move yep. into other concessions, hunting concessions in the area. And if yes. they have the collar on, there's less chance that that animal will get shot. So it's, it's, it's integral to their survival. What was your... What was your feeling about this collar? Does it bother you in the photographs? Do you try and clone it out? Or do you just so, embrace the fact that this is, this is who he is and this is what it looks like? Yeah, it, it's a bit of a mixture of everything. So like, like you say, there, there is unfortunately hunting concessions very close to mana pools. Um, and the guys in mana pools have got smart now. You're not allowed to hunt an animal with a collar. Or we, although we know that means nothing. Cecil had a collar when he got shot. Yeah. Um, also in Zimbabwe. Um, but if you're a collared elephant now, you're not allowed to be hunted. So a lot of the big bulls now, and even some of the smaller ones, are actually being collared. Um, yeah. So it's great for the likes of us who want to go there and enjoy nature alive and kicking. Um, and, and yeah, so photography-wise, it's funny because I hate collars for photography. But as a company, we sponsor collars. So I'm, I'm always on the fence. I know it does so much good. It's way better for the animal. Photography-wise, it, it's not as nice. But somehow on elephants, it, it's not as bad. Like a cat, it really looks like it's in there. It's choking them. It's always front and center because it's quite big versus them. Um, whereas the elephant collar, it, it kind of it just looks like they're wearing a nice little snug harness. It, it's mm. not too bad. Yeah. Um, so he actually has a collar. The, one of the big bulls that often hangs around with him because he knows he's going to get free lunch. Um, he also <laughs> has a collar. Uh, we, we probably saw 15 individuals with, with collars, yeah. but there's also plenty of elephants out there that don't have collars. So if you don't want to shoot the collar, there's always really nice ones um, to yeah. photograph that don't have them. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting, um, you know, those collars are not only there to protect that animal when they leave that area you know against hunters but it also gives very interesting information about those elephants movements because a lot of the areas in Botswana and Zimbabwe and other parts of Africa it's not fenced like it is here in South Africa where we live so these elephant bulls can walk you know thousands and thousands of miles each year and it gives you very interesting information about their movements and talking about elephants it was so remarkable at Chitake Springs where we stayed which is probably a good 50 kilometers away from where you guys were very very strangely the elephants only came to drink at night 
In eight mm. days, we only saw two elephant bulls that walked along the riverbed to the spring where the water bubbles out yeah. during the day. But every sure. evening when we got back to our campsite, just after sunset, big herds, cows mm. with calves would start slowly walking down the riverbed and make their way to the spring. And our guide Carl said that, you know, over the last decade, that's just been their behavior. And mm. I cannot for the life of me figure out exactly why they do that because obviously they're at much less risk from things like lions and stuff like like the buffalo yeah. for instance are the animals that you go to see at Chitake Springs and we saw impala and buffalo and um, baboons and all kinds of other things come mm. and drink during the day but the elephants yeah. nope they only came That's down it. at night so it was, it was strange absolutely as well bizarre. because I mean man I don't know your experience but minor pools is hot uh, we were quite warm, so that's normally when the elephants like to cool off, is in the heat yeah. of the day. So that's that's very weird. It was bizarre. Maybe well, someone knows. Does somebody out there know? You can just put it down Leave there, it and we'll, we'll find well, out. Well, so at Chitake Springs, to give you an idea, um, the the spring itself, it's basically imagine a dry riverbed that that um, is relatively deep. So you've got some steep cliffs on the side. And it goes through a couple of gorges where it's a little bit mm. of sort of rocky along the edge. And then it seems like the, the water table hits a rocky patch. And that's what uh, forces the water up. So yeah. where the actual springs are, the Chitake Spring, it's not deep water at all. So the elephants mm. are never going to do a proper it's mud splashing, bath there that yeah. they, like they might do at a place like Kanga or go into the Zambezi. So they really just go there to, to drink water as opposed to bathing. So there are other water holes in the area, a place called Kavinga, which I spoke mm. speak a little bit about later, has a pump water hole. And there are a few newer water holes that have been drilled in the last few years that are also influencing those elephants and mm. the buffalo's movements. But what I loved so much about um, Chitake Springs is I think because there are only three public campsites and, and, and hence so few people, you literally felt like you were in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So we hardly awesome. ever saw other people. And the fact that we did most of our um, photography or safari I should say on foot made it even more special because the other people that camped there were mostly self-drivers so they were too scared to walk so in the mornings yeah. our sort of um, typical day would start with some coffee around the fire just before sunrise and then as the sun lifted its head above the horizon we would walk straight from our campsite down into the sand check some fresh tracks and then literally just walk you know upstream towards the spring and awesome, see what man. we could bump into. And they've got this, man, I call them gangsters, this gangster pride of lion, <laughs> lions, over 20 <laughs> lions. And what they basically do is they ambush the buffalo that come down and drink. And mm. Every single walk, we found lions on foot. The, the, awesome. One of the three big males is called Hollywood. He's massive. And one day he literally walked into the riverbed after having roared the whole morning. And it, he was the mm. first animal we saw. So everything about Chitake Springs was just very, very wild. But like you say, also a little bit challenging because it's very hot. So there's another yep. top tip. Prepare yourself for the heat if you go in September, yes. October. And it all, there was also a lot of tsetse flies. Um, look, this is nothing mm. new for anything sort of north of, um, well, I, I can't really say north of the Limpopo because there are areas just north of Limpopo where they, uh, they don't occur. But as soon as you reach the Zambezi and north, yeah. You, you get into tsetse fly country. And, Were um, you and surrounded by Mopani? So there definitely was some Mopani felt around, but the mm. sort of immediate vegetation around the riverbed was very diverse. Um, amazing mm. variety of big trees, wild mangoes, um, things like baobab trees, like amazing baobab trees, just an incredible variety of trees. Some of them I can't even remember the names. Um, not mm. typical trees we found here in the low felt. And those tsetse flies that I just spoke about, they, together with the heat, actually forced these lions to climb into trees. So we no, actually awesome. saw lions lying in trees on multiple nice. occasions and got some really, really cool shots of them lying in trees. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, interestingly, uh, where we were, um, there wasn't that many tsetse flies along the river. Uh, so Zambezi expeditions, uh, if we saw one or two in a day, it, it, it was quite a lot. Um, wow. But the drive between Zambezi to Kanga Camp, Kanga Camp is quite far away, and in between is nothing but Mopani felt, and then there was tsetse flies. Mm. Um, 
Kanga Camp, there was a few more than, than Zambezi, but still not as many as in the Mopani, yeah. which, is, which is why I asked if, uh, if you had Mopani. But well, so yeah, I found that what, what worked best for us, um, and this is really a top tip with the tsetse flies, they typically, typically catch you off guard on the first day because you're not quite prepared for them. So the key is to when you get off the plane or out of the car, you must already be prepared. And the best way really is to, well, I found, was you, you have to really cover any exposed bit in um, mosquito repellent or, or any kind of insect repellent. Um, so I was using... <laughs> we, top tip, Dettol. Oh, really, Dettol. So, so one of the guides there, they took uh, a couple of birders that you know, um, out looking for Arnott's Chat, which is right in the middle of Mopani. That's where they live. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden he gets out this little bottle of Dettol and he's rubbing it on like sunscreen. And we're all like, what are you doing? And then he hands it out and he says, oh, it's Tsetse flies. He didn't wow. tell us that on the way through. <laughs> but when they were specifically going to Tsetse fly land, yeah, and they, they didn't get much. So, so Amazing. Rather Definitely, get all than, uh, than bugs Yeah, spread. so that's like a, like a disinfectant. And the other yeah. thing that you have to remember about tsetse flies, they are attracted to the color blue. You'll even see that the, um, the nets that they use and they spray with poison in the park are blue. So mm. try and avoid any blue colored shirts and hats and, and things like and that. And black as well. Um, yeah. And blue, blue and black, black. Yeah. those are the two colors. So heat, tsetse flies, those are, those are toughies. And then also remember, you've got to have... Dust. That's correct. Dust, Dust and good walking shoes. You've got to have good walking shoes because yes. you do spend a lot of time on foot and monopools. And then the dust, my goodness. I, you know, I love the dust because it gives you an opportunity to get some really dramatic photographs. And I don't know if you guys found it there along the river, but what we often did was we tried to purposefully get ourselves in backlight so that if the animals does any kind of movement, you have this little yeah. golden puffs of dust. And especially the buffalo coming down to drink, we yep. were really hoping that they come and drink early in the morning or late afternoon so we can get that dust um, sort of saturated. Yeah. No, the dust is spectacular. So, so again, our, our trips are a little bit different, uh, mine and yours. So we, we obviously in a place where a lot of people go and self-drive. Um, so you were saying you almost saw nobody. We actually didn't see that many people um, until it was time to go to and from camp. And then there was a few vehicles and then dust. So, so we normally give buffs out on our trips. It's one of our, our presents to our guests. Um, because you buffs give uh, so buffaloes to your guests, <laughs> we give them own their own buffalo each. Um, <laughs> I don't have one here, but I'll, I'll have. Here's a photo um, of us wearing our buffs. This is actually Mushatu, but you know, same thing. Um, so really good if you don't want to get dust in your teeth and smile brown. Uh, buffs are really nice, and also yeah. very good for your camera. The guys with the big lenses. They often try and cover their front element or put it in a bag and they're constantly taking their hood on and off and uh, a buff on the end, you, you kind of pull it to the end so it's loose, covers the front and then when, you, when you're shooting, you just pull it back. So, um, But you were saying about shoes, definitely good walking shoes. And yeah, we, we actually drove around. So we, we left camp every day uh, on vehicle and then when we found something, we walked it. So we did the slightly lazier version um than yourself but we did a lot of walking um yeah. i didn't have a watch but we the people on our trip got our steps in every single uh, game drive but it's it's incredible you drive out so again uh, Mich uh monopools being a national park there's no off-roading uh anywhere where you can go where tourists can self-drive they, they'll never be off-roading because they'll get lost and they'll crash their cars and things um so with, with no off-roading, obviously the things can be quite far away. We saw lions a couple of times and they were four or five kilometers away from the river. Sometimes they're a couple of hundred meters. Um, and then the most amazing thing is you go, oh, there it is. And then you just get out and you walk. Um, wow. So we also, we walked yeah, lions incredible. five, six times. We walked elephants every day. We walked the dogs f four or five times. Um, we walked buffalo. Um, yeah, every, everything you see there, if you're not quite close enough, um, we, we just walked, which was yeah, that's fantastic. Amazing. Well, so I think another way that um, the floodplain itself along the river and Chautauqua Springs differ a little bit is you have got a lot bigger variety along the river bed, along the, the Zambezi, and the animals are more relaxed. So at Chautauqua Springs, we 
we, we didn't get as close to a lot of the animals as you would along the river because one, we didn't have those relaxed elephants. Yep. The animals that come down to the spring are all nervous because they know the gang yep. of lions live there. And obviously yep. the lions themselves never let you get that close. So um, a lot of the photographs that I took were animals in the environment, but I love yep. that. And the environment yes. and is, this is the incredibly place beautiful. For it. Exactly. Um, and, and the environment is it's very, very different to the river where you have those big um, trees, but you have the, that sort of orange colors of the edge of the riverbed. And yes. then you have the baobab trees that really, really, um, you know, give you this wonderful points of interest all along the scene. Yeah. And so when we were taking photographs of, of animals, we had to very carefully find our position and often wait a long time. So to give you an example, the um, the main attraction one would say of Chitaki Springs is waiting for the buffalo to come and drink at the springs, yeah. um, and and there are obviously multiple herds of buffalo. But I'll, I'll tell you a funny, sad story. Um, we obviously had this, you know, we were desperate to see a big herd of buffalo coming to drink, and then a pride of lions jumping on their backs, yes. and for some strange reason. Of the first four days, when we had a first group of clients come through, there were no buffalo to be seen. But the lions oh, no. were there every single day. So we, had, we were just surrounded by lions. Every single day, we saw moms, cubs, big males, all oh, sitting there with empty stomachs. So it was like the spring was primed for action. Yeah. And no buffalo came. And then, <laughs> during the second trip, the lions got so fed up, they killed a kudu or something during the night. And then the moment the buffalo came on day number five, the lions were like, oh, well, we're not, we're not going to go and catch the buffalo. Nature, right? <laughs> That's just the way it goes. So, but, but what did actually happen was the first herd of buffalo that came to drink came to drink lunchtime when we were in mm. camp having lunch. So we heard yep. from someone else. The second herd that came to drink, we were actually walking along the riverbed towards the spring. It was early morning, golden light. I remember we were photographing baboons. And our guide, Carl, he called me over and he went like this. Like, <laughs> What's going on? He's like, he went like this. He's like, the buffalo busy drinking. And oh. now we are still 20 minutes walk from the spring. And I'm like, how do you know? He's like, no, I hear them. So he was hearing their hooves coming mm. down to the spring. So we route marched there. As we got there, they were already leaving. And that just shows you, you never know when those animals are going to drink. So yeah, we sat absolutely. there kind of feeling really sorry for ourselves. And as we sat there kind of wiping our tears, another herd arrived. And that's ah, actually that's when awesome. we finally got our shots. And I got that awesome video clip of the GoPro down in the spring with yes, the buffalo yes. stampeding down to, to come and drink. So, yeah, Chitaki Spring was just a, it was a weird place where we had to anticipate the movement of the animals and then kind of be very patient in specific spots to to create these photographic opportunities as opposed to just driving around or walking around hoping you bump into something. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually funny, like it, almost the exact same thing happened to us. Um, so we, we chased Boswell for the for, with the first group. We had him a couple of times far and sleeping and we had him one time really nice, but then he literally stopped as we got there and then the sun set and we had to leave. So Manipal's again, National Park, you have to be in camp by sunset. Um, which is kind of one of the only sort of downers of the park is you get this really nice light and you have to be in camp. In saying that, there was things in camp every day, all day. So there was wow. options to shoot in, in camp. Um, I'm sure I'll put a little video up. We were actually checking guests in and there was an elephant smacking the roof above my head to get the seed pods off the tent. This is why the guys are doing their briefing and nobody was listening because they were. it was their first 10 seconds in minor pools. Here's an elephant literally whacking the roof right above them, walking two feet behind their couches, and nobody was paying attention. Um, nobody heard the safety briefing. Amazing. But so we, we chased Boswell of that first group. When we had dropped those guys at the airport, they had flown out. Um, I had a couple of hours waiting for the next guest to arrive uh, by plane. Boswell walked through the camp. Um, so he walked straight through our camp started doing his thing in the background um i didn't chase him to take photos because i was alone and i was i was doing some work at that stage um and then that afternoon we couldn't find him so uh, it's it's it yeah 
That's it's the way it's it funny goes. how it works. You can plan everything down to a T, but uh, sometimes nature just goes out their ideas. <laughs> Speaking about things in camp, did you guys have um, decent bird life around camp? Um, what was the bird life uh, like yeah, around? So, you did say you had Arnold Chat in the, the Mopani Felt, but what about yes. the, along the river itself? Yeah, so so far we've uh, mostly only actually been speaking about Zambezi expeditions, so that's along mm. the river. Um, there we had flocks of hundreds of thousands of quilias. Uh We had all the normal doves. We had uh, Vera's eagle owl and tree above us. Um, but that camp in particular, there was no like little puddles, little bird baths. Um, the closest thing we had to a camp bird was a hippo called Mitchy. Um, if you didn't know about Mitchie, you got a fright when he rocked up two feet behind you at night. Um, but then when we went down to Kanga Camp, so Kanga Camp is very different in the forest. There they pump this amazing huge water hole. It's, it's probably bigger than about two or three football fields put mm. together. It is monstrous. We were lucky. The elephants have done a number on it, so it's quite dry, except for the cl really close to the lodge and then, uh, and then one side. Um, but there we saw crazy birds. We had Livingston flycatcher, um, we had wood owls, uh, we had all the other things I'm going to forget, swallowtail beaters, carmine beaters, um, uh, nectars. We, we, had, we, we had serious birders on our trip and I think, I think Martin had six or seven lifers and oh. he's, he's a very serious birder. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we had fantastic birds. Um, also like wading birds, fish eagles at the dams. Um, yeah, it, it was, e even the birders will be very, very happy there. Yeah, I must sure. be honest with you. I, when I went to Mona Pools, I didn't really think of that because I was so, you know, I was thinking so much about the Buffalo line interaction that we were hoping to see. And then yeah. I actually ended up seeing four lifers as well. I saw nice. the L Livingston's flycatcher in camp. We had red throated yep. twin spots literally feeding next to our fire in the morning while we were having coffee. And I mean, for those of you that don't know, it's the most beautiful little bird. It's like a strawberry with a tail. Um, and then we saw, I saw uh, Dickinson's kestrel and mm -hmm. I also saw the little Lillian's lovebirds. The, oh, yes, the Lillian's most, lovebirds. Yes, the most colorful Amazing. little birds. And there was a place in the spring where sort of towards the end of the spring before the water disappears in the sand again yeah it forms a very shallow crystal clear little windy bit and what we did we would we would stand on the bank looking down to see where the lovebirds would drink and once mm -hmm. we know where their spot is we would go down and lie on our stomachs in the riverbed and wait for them awesome. and for some strange reason even though there's 50 meters that they could choose from they came back to the same spot and we literally yeah. just lay there waiting and we've got these incredible shots of them you know coming down and taking off over and over and over like this um, yeah. so not only did i see new lifers i managed to actually get shots of the livingston yeah. fire catcher i saw the, that shot the of your spot. livingston oh, beautiful it, it, it so oddly we didn't see them drink at all we oh, saw the, them the lovebirds yeah we saw them almost yeah. every day um Mostly right up the top of the trees, they seem to feed right up the top, and then they fly like rockets. Um, and they're very small, they're, they're tiny. So most people kind of went, ah, ah, that, that was them. Um, and then we had them a couple of times really nicely in Kanga where they sat on the floor feeding, but sort of in, it wasn't long grass, it was like this big, but then yeah. they're tiny birds, so you can see them. But yeah, your drinking shots of them were really well, nice. So maybe before we talk about our upcoming trips next year to Monopools and uh, show you our favorite shots for the trophy, what mm. would you say, um, what lenses would you recommend for people to bring down to the, the, the floodplain itself and the Kanga area, you know, a little bit further yeah. towards the Zambezi? What would you say worked the best for you? So I, I took a 35 mil thinking we're going to get really close to elephants and we're going to have them right here and we're going to shoot up into the trees. That didn't really happen um, for a couple of reasons. One, you could do it with Boswell, but he's always got friends. Um, and then two, yeah, we'd rather just be a little bit further back and then, and then you get a nicer perspective. Shooting too wide, all the trees get small, whereas yeah. shooting with a 70 to 200, the trees stay quite big. Um, so definitely a 70 to 200. Um, I, I didn't find r really a need to go much wider than that, much wider than 70, which I thought I would, but mm. I've, I've found out along the way that my landscape photography is with a long lens as well. So um, 
7200 for but sure. It's, but it's because you can control your distance, right? It's because yes. you're not confined yeah. to a car. So when you're on Absolutely, foot, yeah. using that 70 to 200 is so much easier because at 70, where you are getting a lot in, you can just walk a little bit further away or a little bit closer. Yeah. So it's a lot easier or, or you can controlling. Stitch. Yeah, yeah, so we, we did some stitching some days. Um, and then I, I was actually very lucky. Canon gave me a the new RF 100 to 300 to test out for the Safari, um, which is an absolutely incredible lens. We will talk about that uh, in another video. Um, and that that was such a cool lens. So it's a 2.8, it's a 100 to 300. So it's very similar to a 70 to 200 uh, on the short end. Um, but then on the long end, obviously you've got that extra hundred mil, but I actually ended up using it with the two times teleconverter more often than not. Mm. Um, elephants far away in the forest at 600 mil just look fantastic because it's the, the blue forest of minor pools. So the elephants are kind of look normal tone and everything in the background has got this blue haze and you didn't really see it as nicely with the shorter lens. So. I shot a lot at 600 mil. Um, personally, if I went back and I could only take one lens, uh, it would probably be the Sony 200 to 600 or it would be a 600 Prime um, and then I'd use my phone for anything wider. But yeah, <laughs> or, the longer is actually better because you're yeah. often far away as well. And like you say, you walk lions a lot, but the lions don't let you get that close. Um, so a 600 mil or 500 mil is better than a 4 or a 300. Mm. Um, yeah, you kind of want from 70 to 600, <laughs> which no, right. is not helpful so, to anyone. Well, but. so that actually, that's a good point. So that's why I would say for Chitaki Springs specifically, where I think we spent even more time on foot than you did. Yeah. So we were walking sometimes up to three hours on foot on a game walk, a photography walk. Yes. Um, my Canon 100 to 500 RF which is a great range and a nice light lens worked yep. incredibly well. It yep. gave me the opportunity to take animals in the environment at 100 on a, on a full yep. frame R6, uh, but also get nice and close for things like those lovebirds drinking and lions lying in the distance. So I would yep. say for Chitaki Springs specifically, if you're going to take only one lens, something yep. like 100 to 400, 100 to 500 or 150 to 600, Yep. And then because there are so many baobab trees, I actually did use my wide angle, my 16 to 35, quite a lot as well. Nice. Because yeah. there's actually one spot where there's 12 baobabs growing on a hill. It's actually a sacred site and you're yeah. allowed to walk around there. Um, awesome. It's an overflow campsite. So as long as there aren't other people camping there, you can go there for sunset and walk oh, around, nice. have your sundowners there. So that's what we did. We actually went there to have our sundowners. So some people could sip GNTs while the other yeah. people walk around and photograph Baobab. So I used my 16 to 35 F4 nice. and my 100 to 500 RF a lot. Um, so yes, it's always good to go prepared with the right stuff and, and always think to yourself, um, how much am I going to have to carry? And because you're doing a light yes. aircraft flight in, a small yep. small aircraft, you have to also consider weight. Um, you might yep. have to leave a few things back at home just because there will be weight constrictions, uh, and yeah. restrictions so, flying in. So we actually booked for our clients, we booked a freight seat, which gave everyone an extra 10 kilos each because wow. otherwise the flights in are quite low. It's 20 kilos maximum, I think it was, 20. Um, so we booked an extra freight seat, gives us 60 or 70 kilos for every, uh, everyone combined. So we, we could take um, bigger stuff. Um, but did you, did you use anything to carry your cameras or did you just have the normal strap around your lid? Uh, so you know lead? what I've done? You know, I actually, I can't even remember when I bought it, but I hate the normal straps. Yes. The normal strap that comes They're with rubbish. a Canon camera are rubbish. So I found a strap and I cannot for the life of me even remember where I bought it. But it's got a very wide band and it's mm. slightly elastic. Um, oh, yes. And it's got little yeah. pockets in it for, for extra memory cards. And even though it clips on the normal strap points, it's not on the lens. It doesn't screw into the lens foot or something like that. Yes. It literally just hangs around your neck. I actually hang it over my shoulder. Because of that little bit of give and the wider, very soft, spongy, wide band, it feels yeah. like I'm not even carrying it. So yes, it is perfect, worthwhile yeah. considering how, you, how you're going to carry your camera. Because I had one of my guests that actually came with a big backpack because he wanted his 400 2.8 in the back. But yeah. a lot of the things that happen, happen quite quickly. And then, you know, it's just not practical. So you've got to think quite carefully on how you're yeah. going to carry your cameras. Yeah, so the reason, the reason I asked is actually just before I, I went away, I picked up a, um, a harness from Grizzly. 
uh, in Joburg. So they, they actually make harnesses out of leather. Um, and they are beautifully made. Uh, got it branded with the logo and everything. And it's, it's a dual harness, so I'm sure we'll put a photo up here. Um, because every day I walked, when we, every time we walked, I took the 100 to 300 with the two times tele converter on it, which is a big, heavy lens. It's, uh, it's a little bit heavier than a 300 2.8 prime if, if you've ever used one of those. So it, it's quite heavy. Um, I think with the camera, it's about three and a half ish kilos. And then I always had the 70 to 200 on the other body. Um, but instead of putting a camera on the floor and then shooting with the other camera, which is a nightmare or trying to put something in a backpack or trying to take two lenses on one camera and you're trying to change lenses in the field, which is a nightmare. Um, I just use this harness. So I, I carried them. And then when I was using one camera, I just put the other camera and left it float nice. on my hip, um, which is very cool. So that, that made the, the trip much easier because like you say, when you're walking with heavy stuff or two bodies, it's, it's easy to hold two bodies, but you can't shoot with two bodies. Yeah. Exactly. Um, it's it's very difficult. So this this harness is is very cool, and I think we have a sneaky suspicion we might see these harnesses coming up in a future episode. Nice. Um, hmm, nice. We'll we'll chat about that again later. Well, well, guys, it's very obvious that Lance and I both had incredibly successful safaris to Mono pools, and that's why both of us are going back again next year, more or less over the same time. So I'll be leading a trip again for Africa Geographic, but this time instead of going to Chitake Springs. We're doing a slightly different trip. It's going to be a little bit longer. It's going to be an eight-night safari for six people. The first four nights are at a place called Kavinga Camp, which is very close to Chitake Springs, which is, again, far away from the river, and they pump water in front of camp, and they have an underground hide overlooking that waterhole. Great area for buffalo, elephant, wild dogs, lions, um, and we do walks and game drives there as well. And then the last four nights, we'll also be going down to the floodplain where we'll be staying at Vundu Camp. And that's basically a similar area to where Lance spent um, the first bit of his safari, well, your first safari, and I think yeah, we saw those guys the second safari times, yeah. again. Yeah. So um, I will definitely leave a link to that safari and um, details in the video description along with the safari that Lance is going to do again next year for Panthera Photo Safari. So Lance, what are your plans for next year? What does your trip look like? Uh, yeah, so it's basically the same thing. Uh, we're starting out at uh, Zambezi Expeditions and then we're moving over to Kanga because it's such a good combination. Um, and then we've actually already booked our 2025 dates uh, wow. where we're doing it slightly differently. So we're actually flying to Zambezi Expeditions first, followed by Kanga again. And then we're tacking on a flight to uh, Hwangi. We're going to Somalisa nice. Camp. So, nice. um, a, a nice variation, a bit, a uh, bit more different scenery. Hwangi is very different to Mana Pools. Uh, amazing elephants, uh, decent chance for cheetah, um, lions, things like that. Um, so that'll be a nine night trip, ten day trip, nine nights. Uh, whereas twenty twenty four is still the the six nights, seven days. Um, so you yeah, know what sucks? Cool. I had a look. I think you fly out when I fly in. <laughs> We're going to miss each other. So this time Typical. we'll be in the same area, but we're just going a little bit later. It, it all had to do with availability at Kavinga. Um, so yeah, we'll yeah. be there sort of towards the last week of September and you'll be there. I think I, th I had a look at your dates. I, I think, think it's slightly earlier. Really, yeah. Yeah. You're, uh, so, um, but anyways, guys, both of us will be back in Monopools in September, which is a great time of the year. You can, you know, go and uh, learn all the information about those trips by following those links in the video description and obviously as always any other important links will be there as well including the links to our patreon pages so for those of you that don't know panthera photo safaris has a conservation fund where you can make a monthly donation through patreon to um, basically have some funds available if anybody in our area needs emergency funds to maybe remove a snare from an animal, buy a collar for an animal, whatever needs to be done. So go and check out that link if you want to make a, a contribution for conservation purposes. And on my Patreon page, you'll see I basically have the page to, well, basically to for you to give me an opportunity to do this full time, to be a full time content creator. So if you feel like you want to support the Safari Expert YouTube channel where we host this podcast, 
you're also welcome to check that out and make your monthly donation. And for those donations, you do get some monthly rewards as well, and that might be early access to the videos, a few other things that we share with you, like behind the scenes footage. And as always, we also give you mentions in our video, which we'll do right now. So thank you, patrons. These are the people that, uh, that support <laughs> us. But guys, no, in all seriousness, we really do appreciate um, those contributions very, very much because they make a significant difference. Lance, it's a very important time now. It's time for us to show each other our best photograph from Mana Pools. So basically how this is gonna work, you haven't seen mine, I haven't no. seen yours, but that doesn't matter at all because it's the viewers that are gonna vote. So for all of you watching this video, please take the time, pause the video after we've shown it, or remember to do it at the end, but I think pause it immediately, and all you need to do to vote is type either Lance or Philia in the description. So the photo you like best, type it in there, and then what we'll do is on the day that we shoot the next podcast, and I'm not sure whether that's gonna be in two weeks or four weeks or whenever it is, we'll tally it up, and in that podcast, one of us will get the trophy. So, um, Lance, I don't know about you, but I'm I nervous very, all of a sudden. <laughs> I had a very different shot in mind. My shot that I thought I was going to show now was going to be a buffalo in the dust with a lion kind of f flung off the back. It's <laughs> yeah. not that. It's not that. When and, you and when you show me the shots that you were going for, I conceded. <laughs> I already gave you the trophy. So I'm. So you're telling me you didn't get those shots? Well, I didn't get those shots, but I'll tell you. I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. I thought that I've got to choose my shot based on how people will perceive it on the screen of their phone or iPad or whatever they're watching it on. Oh, so okay. I was a little bit nervous choosing my favorite shot um, yeah. because I thought maybe it won't really translate well on a smaller screen. But then I thought, you know what? No. I am going <laughs> to choose my favorite shot. So I was very <laughs> honest with myself. I went through all my shots. And I'm going to show you a couple of ones that I considered that I thought might translate better on a small screen. Okay. But then I'll show you the actual shots. Yeah, I won't yeah, confuse okay. you. I won't <laughs> confuse you. But I wanted to give you an idea of kind of the shots that I, that I had in mind in, in contention. Cool. But the shot that I eventually chose, it's more of an animal in the environment. And even though it might get a little bit lost on a smaller screen, this is, That's you right. know, I've, I've got a 27 truth. inch screen ready now. <laughs> it is my favorite shot from the trip and I'll explain to you why. So um, are we gonna, uh, um, let's do rock, paper, scissors to who shows first. Just one go. You ready? Rock, yeah. paper, scissors, go. Oh, wait, no, that's it. <laughs> now you know I wanted to play scissors. That's not fair. So we do it like this. Just so you guys know, there is about a quarter of a second delay between the, uh, the two of us. So that was a nightmare. Yeah, I'll, do it, I'll do it slowly. Are you ready? I'll do it with my eyes shut. Ready? Okay. Rock, paper, scissors, go. Uh, is my hand in there? Ah, okay, so you go first. <laughs> no. Nonsense, you go first. <laughs> okay, so before we get into that, I thought that my favorite shot would be an animal in the environment shot because that's kind of why we went and then it turns out that it, it kind of is but it kind of isn't and anyway instead of faffing on let's get into it so i'll, I'll do the same thing so I, I want to show you quickly two shots i thought might have been it um don't accidentally then... show your favorite shot first <laughs> yeah <laughs> can you can you see my screen oh yes i can so I see Boswell. This this is the famous Boswell. I thought this would be my favorite mm. shot, um, and I do like this shot, but it's it's not my favorite shot. It's nice. And then the same the same guy, a little bit different lighting. I quite like the high key of yeah. this, but it's also nice not side my pose, shot. beautiful profile pose. Yeah. As well. But uh, my favorite shot <laughs> turned out Ooh. to be this one. What are you doing? Oh my proof. Yo. Can you zoom out and ah? Oh. <laughs> you see, folks, this is why we go to Mana Pools. That opportunity to Absolutely. go on foot, lie on your stomach, and photograph these animals at eye level. And it's not from an underground hide. This is out in the wild on foot. Yo. Yeah, that's nice, eh? So. 
Yeah, I, I, I cried a few times um, mm. thinking of the shots I didn't bring home. And then when I, met, I found this one. <laughs> was that I photographed was with your good. Canon 100 to 300 2.8? Yes, I believe so. Let me, I can actually show you the specs on here, I That's think. Where have I gone? Uh, oh, I'm out. Can you still see it? So, yeah. 600 mil on the, on the 100 to 300 yeah. and taken at 5.6. So, so shot so wide open. Um, what a shot. Yeah, it was that. Yeah, I love the yellow and the blue colors complement each other. Beautiful. Yeah, so we were actually that sitting. that light from the side, Lawrence? So, we were sitting with this lion. Um, uh, is the time on here? It was before sunrise. You see, 6.43. We were sitting with them in the shade. But there was actually cubs playing over here to the left, doing all sorts of cute stuff. And I, I'm not joking. I took maybe one photo of this lioness this day, and it was this one. We were only focused on the cubs. The cubs were playing. They were jumping on each other. It was amazing. And she was just lying in the shade doing nothing. And then the sun came over the horizon, and just a tiny strip of it just touched her um, and as you can see it it wasn't on the background it wasn't on the foreground it was just on her yeah um, and then and i genuinely said to people oh look how cute she's lying and everyone went shut up and they were they were clicking away at the cubs i took one shot of her um, and it was this one, and it turned out to be my favorite shot. Why don't you, <laughs> you put it in full screen quickly? I'm going to quickly um, pretend that uh, you posted this on our Instagram page with the Safari Shots podcast hashtag and give you a bit of feedback. So I'll tell you why I think this is such an awesome shot. I think you actually nailed it. It's that cute pose, isn't it? You know, eye contact yeah, is always is great. Me, yeah. But it's the fact that she's got the one foot on the other foot and then the head on that with the yeah. eye contact, ears forward. And then obviously yep. the body is just lying in the perfect position because you could get the tail and the feet in as well. Um, yes. and, and I love the fact that you actually got that little bit of earth out of focus in the foreground um, because that's what draws your eye straight to the face. Um, so yeah, yeah I, I do love it a lot. And I really I, love what yeah. you've done with the, um, the crop, the super, super narrow panoramic crop. It looks really yes. good. Yes, yes. So it's actually, uh, I, I will not lie, it is a stitch. So I thought so. I, thought um, so. I, I, pr it's, I think it's, let's guess, four, four images. Yeah. Um, and the reason the background is so nice is because I've shot her at 600 mil, but she was quite close. She was 20, 30 meters. So if I had shot this wider at 100 mil, which I could have done, I could have got her whole body in with one shot. Um, all that background came into focus. So the depth mm. of field gets much bigger. All the foreground in front of her got very sharp. And then it is still a very nice pose, but you, it kind of got lost. There was no separation. Um, and so sh keeping it out at 600 mil and then doing a stitch. Um, so yeah. taking lots of shots side by side and then putting them together in, in Lightroom. Um, it just gives you that magic sort of eerie feel. Where, and it's just a, it's, this is what I look for when I go out on... Uh, safaris every time where can i shoot something that is clean backgrounds yeah uh, you've known me for a long time i used to shoot with a 500 f4 prime and a 200 f2 prime because i like that background um, yeah. turns out the 100 to 300 also does really nice backgrounds yeah. if anyone's uh, looking epic. to buy a big shot oi those of you that had just paused the video and typed in Lance, wait, you've got to see no, my no, no, shot no. first Keep as typing. well. <laughs> Keep typing. Type, type, type. Guys, so I'm now ready. you know, <laughs> that's, the shot. that's the shot that you're voting for for Lance. And spoiler alert, my favorite shot is of a lion as well. So I think this is actually great <laughs> because this is, you know, this is a good face-off. Um, but let yeah. me do exactly the same. I'll show you. Show me um, the two what, duds first. <laughs> I'll show you what I had in mind. There's actually four duds. Yeah, um, so he's cheating so again. He's changed the rules every time. Can you see this? Not yet. Three, okay, two, give it a second. One. Okay, now I can see it. Yeah. Right. So the first shot I had in mind was this close up of the buffalo that came down to drink. So this was essentially when a big herd of about 200 buffalo came down, and I just zoomed in tight to create this sort of slightly abstract shot. And I really like sort of the horns and the light and the, you know, the contrast and all of it. So that was definitely a contender for me. Um, this is a shot that I took of a baboon running across the riverbed in backlight um, at a very, very slow shutter speed. So it kind of looks like there's a ghost baboon 
running out the other one. It goes big baboon and a small baboon. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. exactly. So we had a lot of fun actually doing these kind of shots. So that was definitely one of my favorite shots from the trip. I think had they, they been a little bit more frozen, I had a, if I had a proper panning shot, they definitely What was your shutter it. speed there? So this Tenth. one, let's have a Just very quick look. I think I was... Hmm. Let me just check again. Yep, spot on. A tenth of a second. Yeah. So anyone who anyone who's done panning knows the animals move at the perfect speed for the shutter speed that you've just set, and then they bugger off or they stop moving, and it, it's the most <laughs> frustrating thing ever. You set it, you see one animal go, and you go, okay, the perfect shutter speed for that next time, and you set it to that, and the next one walks, or you exactly. get it perfectly dialed, and the next one walks and stops. It's oh. We were anyway, very lucky awesome, that awesome these guys were chasing each other back and forth. So another contender was these lovebirds that came down to drink. So this gives I you a great really example. Like yeah, yeah, a great example of the sort of photos we were able to get of That's those lovebirds nice. when we were lying. Can on I our give stomach. you some you... feedback on this one? Yeah, go for it. I, your horizon squiff. <laughs> uh, are you sure it's not just the stream that skew? <laughs> the stream is but going the, downhill, right? You're right. Yeah, yeah I'll exactly. Give you that. <laughs> well, you'll actually see that there are some impalas in the background. So that was quite yes. cool. You know, it was a real, oh, it was sort of a moment there. And That's then the other one that I considered, this, this is the little, um, I love the shot of the, the mm. little um, uh, red-throated twin spot that came to, uh, you know, came into camp. It was just, yeah, it was a beautiful little shot. But... That's not my, my go-to shot. So if you guys are ready, this is my favorite shot from the trip. Don't know if you can see that oh, wow. nicely there. So it's essentially very much an animal in the environment. It's, the awesome. lioness is tiny, tiny in the frame. But this is the end of the spring. So essentially mm. that's in the background is where the water disappears back into the sand. And this is just a very classic scene in Chitake Springs. If you walk along the riverbed, this is essentially what you see all of the way. And this awesome. was, if I recall correctly, early in the morning, um, the lioness was lying on the one back, bank and she was just decided to join the rest of the pride on the other side. And obviously we saw the baobab on the other side and we knew exactly the line that she was going to take. So it was just a case of mm. choosing a portrait orientation to get the baobab tree in and then, you know, taking a high frame rate so that you get her legs nicely when she actually walks yeah. through the water. So That's actually me, a good tip for people as well, is yeah. a lot of people go, why do you take bursts? Why do you shoot more than one shot? It's all the same. It's not. If you got her two feet together right next to each other, kind of leaning into the shot, it wouldn't be yeah. a nice shot at all. Whereas that Absolutely. timing on that pose is really nice. Absolutely. So for me, um, those of you that have followed me over the years, you know that I absolutely love animals in the environment. And it's sometimes really hard to get good shots, especially wide shots like this, that not only do justice to the animal, but also to the environment. So for me, um, if I have to be completely honest with myself, this is definitely my favorite shot from the trip. Beautiful light on the lioness, a little bit of a reflection in the water. She's got an extremely strong sort of uh, position of her body. Um, and then if I zoom in, you'll see that because of the side light, it kind of accentuates her muscles and her body really, really nicely. And Oof. then I just did you, love... Yep. Did you by chance take any 500 mils of that? That there close, close was also this. a very no, nice crop. Just, just zoom in one more time. <laughs> Let's do this. That. I'll tell you why I didn't. Because Oof. I knew that I only have that one moment of her yeah. going through. And so you've got to be so careful that yep. um, you get caught up between taking your wide and your close-up shot. And then you sacrifice yes. both. Because yep. that perfect moment when she's walking through the three meters of water, you, yep. you, uh, you know, you overcommit. And we've so all in done this it. sense, I just went wide. So, yeah, but we've before all done, especially we lose, when people have two cameras and you're sitting there going, uh, 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 and then you've missed everything. We've all been there. <laughs> so, this is the moment where you pause the video, don't go make a cup of tea. All you need to do is type in Lance L for a beautiful a. line close up. <laughs> or for Leah for a nice um, animal in the environment. And if you don't know how to spell for Leah, just type that. <laughs> if you don't know how to spell for Leah, don't worry. It starts with L-A. <laughs> we shouldn't you use can, psychology to influence people. Eh? <laughs> you can just do L, L or V as well. Loser and winner. <laughs> no, LV is my initials. So that also, that's me. <laughs> 
Lance, I must say, I really enjoy this. It, it, it brings back great memories from the days we used to actually lead trips together when we were playing for the trophy. And we'll keep doing this in the future. Um, whenever we go to a similar destination, especially over the same time, we'll pull out the old trophy and let you guys vote. And uh, we'll make sure to, to show off a little bit as well. We ever, How are we uh, going to engrave it? this thing? We're just going to write in pen. Like Permanent marker, <laughs> big V on it. <laughs> <laughs> Lance, so this brings us to the end of the podcast where we are going to, first of all, um, we're going to dive into Instagram, type in the Safari Shots podcast hashtag, and both of us, what we've done is we've chosen a favorite, and yep. we've also chosen a photograph where we're going to give a little bit of constructive criticism, and then I've, I'm also going to randomly choose a winner for this week's prize, and... Mm. I want to, again, thank everybody for sharing your photographs. I know it's not always possible for us to get to every single one, but we will go back to some of them in the future if we want to talk about specific things. So please, please keep using that hashtag. Share your photograph, photographs. It's not only a cool way for us to see what you are doing, but for you guys to see what each other's doing. So it's basically a yeah. community where we can inspire each other. And I see some people have even posted some videos. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, so Lance, um, I don't know if you want to go first. Are you happy? What's your, yeah, I can, um, I can go first. What's yeah. your favorite shot? So, let me share the screen again for you. It'll be a lot easier. So, this week was very hard um, because I first saw this shot and I was kind of like, well, you can't it's get much better nice. than that so of nice. an Impala, right? And then by, I, I think saw, it was, um, that one was by Andrew McDonald. If I Andrew McDonald, yeah. In and fact, then I, I saw this shot. Both, hey? Yes, yeah, so then I saw this shot and I thought, well, that's a little bit better. And then I saw it was also Andrew McDonald. So um, my vote this week is for Andrew McDonald. Um, interestingly enough, this is, a, this is a guy that we need to get onto the podcast to have a chat with us. Um, really cool guy. He's got a, a YouTube channel himself. I will put it down uh -huh. below, I'm sure. Um, and he's, he's been to amazing places, but also a very interesting guy to listen to. So nice. one of our goals uh, going forward is to get other photographers on here to talk photography. Um, and Andrew is on that list. Um, so, so keep an eye out for that. But I, I would have to say this is my favorite shot of this week. I mean, I don't even nearly have a shot like this. It is absolutely incredible. Um, the just freezing the motion, the pores coming out, all that water splashing out, the perfect reflection, um, beautiful light. It's nice and flat. It's not too harsh. There's nothing harsh about it at all. It's just, ugh. it almost makes me sick. Actually, we shouldn't have Andrew on. It'll make us look bad. Maybe we should. Uh... <laughs> yeah. So, job. so these these two shots. Uh, an honourable mention has to go out to. Oh. I think this was the feral photographer again. It was so um, good. So yeah, good. it's just that's just ridiculous. Epic. A beautiful Epic. pose of that one elephant. Um, I would have liked the timing to be a little bit different with these other elephants, a little bit more in. But you know, nature. I'll tell you what, to Lawrence. Us. I'll tell you what. A eh? in his defence, I bet you what happened here. He must have taken a series of shots, but that pose of the elephant in the front yeah. is perfect. So by yep. the time the others join the fray or a little bit more you know you yeah. can see their silhouettes a little bit better that one is not in that position anymore so you know my eye just goes to that elephant immediately but what, yeah. what also works so well here two things one the complementary yellow in the sky and the dust but yes. also the fact that that tree in the top right wasn't clipped that's super yeah. important super yeah. duper important that that Massive, whole tree is yeah. in so compositionally i think he absolutely nailed it. it's an awesome shot yeah. So if, if I took this shot and I took it for myself, which is why I take photos, I take photos for myself, I would have taken a lot of photos and then I would have maybe replaced the, uh, the two elephants on the left when they were further in. Um, so you can take a whole bunch of shots where you don't move the camera. And then when the second elephant's a little bit closer to the first one, I would Photoshop that in, just the elephant, and then the third elephant as well, just so you see the whole bodies. But that naughty, is cheating, you're right. Naughty, I can naughty, hear naughty. everyone yelling at me already. That is right. Like I said, if I took it for myself, yes. um, not for a competition, Very but cool. even even as is, stunning image, stunning, stunning, what a stunning. Shot. So I've never definitely seen a worth shot like a, that. A mention yeah i actually yeah i think that's why it stuck out as well because it's it's very different to to anything else so very cool awesome. and then a little bit of feedback about this i believe this was lucas walter um and this this shot 
the first time I saw it and I was thinking, oh, this is actually one of my favorites. And then I kind of looked again a bit closer and I don't, I don't know if you can see it. It's almost like the eyes, something's funny's happened with the eyes. I don't know if it's shooting through foliage and there's an it's out like of focus a leaf. It's almost like a glare. Yeah, yeah, or if it is a little bit of perhaps not so good Photoshop or Lightroom where you've taken a brush and tried to brighten in here mm. and, it, and it's gone a little bit funky. That um, may very well be exactly what happened. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, it looks a bit like a brush because it's kind of lost yeah. detail and things. So for me, I, if it is a brush and it's not a leaf, if it is a leaf, there's nothing you can do about it. But if it is a brush, um, I would have hi highlighted the catch lights a little bit personally mm. myself and not done so much of the other things or just the really yes. bright highlights that you already see I would have enhanced those but not the dark areas because when you enhance the dark areas it goes a little bit flat and you can kind of see some things happen there so yeah but very see, cool shot yeah I just want to quickly see who that photo was by I think it's I think Lucas that Walter. was by Lucas Walter yeah that's right yes that's yes. right very cool shots and very great feedback because you can see what's happened here. You can actually see the light coming from the top and that's obviously filtering through the leaves and what that's going to do with something with such a big brow is yes. darken the eyes. Absolutely. But the bright bit there is the catch light in the eye. So you've got to be yep. so careful not to brighten something that's dark. Only brighten the things that are bright already and that's where you're going you're gonna to do something a little bit more natural. Yeah. If, we, if we've actually got time... So, a, as an example, this may or may not work. Um, so, I, you, there's a dodging and burning which you could do on, on an image like this. So, if you want to do it, I would do it in Lightroom, but you can do it in Photoshop as well. Um, so, by using black and white brushes. So, here is a white brush. And then you kind of go over these highlights, right? So, just the highlights. But it doesn't just have to be the eyes. It can be all these little pieces. And you would use different sized brushes to match the size of the highlights that you're trying to enhance. Even these little pieces in like this. And mm. then something like soft light or overlay. You'll see how that, um, it's now not funky, it kind of, uh, let me turn it on and off. You see how it's just making a little mm. bit brighter, but it still respects the shadows. And then with another layer, with a black brush, you could do something very similar. Uh, what is my brush on? Let's turn my brush up so you can see it. So in here, so if this is a leaf, this is very rough, by the way. <laughs> if this it's is a leaf in front of it, show, yeah, yeah you, you could actually get a little bit of that contrast coming back just by painting over these natural shadow areas that are already in here. Something like this. Let's go to soft light again and then turn the opacity down a bit. So, and of course, you would match mm. the shape perfectly yeah. of uh, what you're trying to do. You wouldn't just wang it all with one sort of normal brush. So here is the original, and then here's with a little bit more yeah. contrast. And that's that's a very rough example, of and course, it took but 12 no, it seconds. Makes 100 but hundred uh, percent sense. Yeah, you're getting a little sense. bit more contrast and clarity back in your shot, which is super important. And remember, you wouldn't have done that over that bit that's been brightened already. It would have been done no, on you the do original. That, you which do that make instead big, of. Yeah, yes, it'll make a big yes. instead of correct. Yeah. yeah. No, so, very cool, but great, if, if it is. If it is uh, a leaf though, so if it's not an editing issue, it is actually a leaf that's out of focus shooting through, you can kind of fluff it a little bit. by add, So you would do something similar to that and then also paint the area and add clarity. Yeah. And that'll add punch to it and you'll hopefully yeah. sort of take that whatever that fuzziness was away. Cool. Awesome, man. Well, so let me quickly share with you some of mine. So Lance, I'm sorry, I don't actually have mine on the computer to share like you did, which was actually a really no good idea. Have you, you got go your phone Instagram close by just to open it quickly? I In, do. While you're doing that, I'll quickly show a couple of honorable mentions as well. So I love the shot of the leopard sitting on the termite mountain by Neil Jennings. Um, I just love those clouds in the background and the color and the space in the direction that the leopard is looking. So absolutely epic shot. And then another shot that um, I really thought deserves an honorable mention is this one of the leopard faced vulture by uh, Vince Ward Photography. Lance, you can look at that as Ooh, well. Yes, yes. Will it focus? There it is. Beautiful, yep, beautiful, beautiful shot. And what I love about that shot is just a really beautiful high key conversion. You know, those, those can be quite tricky to do. Um, and I, so I really love that shot. But my favorite shot from this week is actually, it's quite a strange one. It's the one by Mark Moll. 
um, of the leopard in the spotlight. I don't know if you saw that one. It's actually the black leopard of Lycipia Giza. Okay. Absolutely yep. love that shot. And I'll tell you why I love this shot so much. It was photographed early enough to get that colorful sky in as well. And that's not always easy to get right. So this for me, with that beautiful sort of round spotlight area on the ground, the yeah. backlit leopard with the light in the photograph, so you can actually see the spotlight and then together with this beautiful sky, that for me is a storytelling shot. Yep. There are very few other photographs posted on the Safari Shots um, podcast hashtag that look anything like this. It's because it's so incredibly difficult to get, not only because of the difficult light conditions, but also, you know, to tell a story. So for me, yeah. beautiful, Mark, I think you absolutely nailed it. Definitely my favorite shot of the lot. And then the shot that I thought I'd give some very sort of um, quick feedback on is actually by um, Andrew McDonald. So if you scroll through Lance and you find the series of shots of the lioness with her cub in the sun, it's a beautiful, beautiful shot. I love the colors. I love that it's slightly underexposed to give you that dark silhouette on the lions. But what I would have done here is to do what you did with your best shot um, uh, for our Mana Pools competition where you cropped it down a little bit. So in this case for me, there's, a, there's a little cloud. bit too much sky. And I'll tell you what it is. It's that thin layer of cloud at the top. Yeah. I always look for little bits at the top that can just be cut off. Yes. And in this case, I, and I'll tell you why, when I look at the photograph, my eye, the periphery, just keeps jumping to the top. It yeah. keeps jumping up. Yeah. It keeps jumping up. So, so for, for guys out there who are wanting, we talked about competitions last time, and are wanting to enter competitions, a really cool trick is to, I don't know if this is going to work. Here we go. Well, now, when you're editing and you edit, then, and then what you do is you actually flip your photo upside down and walk away, and then come back in a few minutes, so that when you come back, your shot is like this. So when judges are looking at photos, they look for random stuff. But one of the things is where your eye naturally goes in a shot. And where your eye naturally goes in a shot are the brightest areas. White is one of the worst things in a photo because your eye always wants to go to white. It's just the way our brains work. The reason we flip the shot is because you've been editing this for however long. You don't see things anymore. You've got your editing filter on. So flip it upside down, walk away. When you come back in and you look at it, all of a sudden you'll see it very obvious when you see, okay, there's where your eye goes first and then it goes straight here. And then it's, yeah. a, and then it's a fight between, between the two bright yeah. parts. What a great um, tip. Yeah, that's an yeah, excellent it's a, tip. And it's there. a simple, simple little way of yeah. just, uh, because you're not seeing it as your image anymore, you're just looking at it as a bunch of pixels and colors. Yeah. And where does your eye go? Yeah. I think with this spot, uh, I think with this shot specifically, I also would have loved for that cub not to be. I think it's licking its paw. I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm, that's I what I've been trying to, to figure actually, out. What it is? Yeah. yeah, I would have loved to actually just see the two profiles as opposed to having that paw up because it, it could have been a stick or something like that. I think yeah. it would have been a little bit more powerful had it just been the profile of the cub. Yeah, and, and if you saw the same the fluff as mum, been, yeah, that perfect mirror of mum. Well, guys, thank you. I agree with all those things. That's the first time we've ever agreed on images. <laughs> hey, I, I must say, guys, I'm incredibly impressed by the photographs that you guys posted. And um, to thank you guys for doing that, we're going to try and do this every time we do the podcast. We're going to give away a random prize. And this week, um, I would like to thank someone who was extremely generous. Um, she actually contacted me right after we did the previous podcast where Stay Wild um, sponsored that lovely gift, gift pack. Awesome. And she's called Kaylee Heisemann, and she's from a company called Wild Kids Book SA. And I'll pop their link, um, the Instagram uh, uh, handle on the screen. Please go and follow her. And she has very, very generously sponsored a hamper of products, which includes a Wild Kids 2024 diary for boys, a African-themed notepad or notepads, birds, animals, and insects, a Kruger National Park guide, a vapes water bottle, and the biggie is a voucher to Tamboti River campsite for eight people for two nights worth 2,400 Rand. And for those oh, of you that don't nice. know, that's in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, somewhere close to Mkuzi, if I remember correctly. And the prize, the hamper in total, is worth 3,800 Rand. So, Kaylee, awesome. thank you so, so much for that. I am going to, like last time, quickly choose a winner randomly. 
the old fashioned way. So I'm gonna go into the Safari Shots podcast and now we have a lot of photos here. So I'm gonna go blindfold, so blindfold. Populate. <laughs> JMX. John Molyneux, John Molyneux, you are our winner. It's JMX Images and you will be getting a probably an email from um, Kaylee who I asked um, to contact you directly. She's going to arrange for you to get your, your products and your voucher for the campsite. I hope that you and your family and friends enjoy it very much. I hope you've got kids as well because there's some lovely um, you know, products there for kids. So guys, please go and check out... Awesome. Um, that Instagram account, go and check out all the other amazing posts on our hashtag, go and follow our own social media channel, channels if you're not doing so already. And please remember to check out our Safari links and Patreon links at the top of the video description. Lance, it's been fun chatting to you from the other side of the country, as always. Yes, this um, is the I furthest we've been. Correct, and I'll send some cool weather and rain your way. Oh, please um, do. <laughs> yeah, and you can send some sun our way. Yeah. You can have it all. Yeah. It's so hot. <laughs> I can see him getting redder and redder. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope you enjoyed episode four of the Safari Shots podcast. Um, also remember to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And leave your vote for your favorite photograph from our Mana Pools trips. Until next time. We need to do an outro. Pew, pew, pew. Pew, 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 pew.